Murder by Decree is based on characters created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, the Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, Inspector Lestrade, but it's not based on any actual work by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, it's one of several fictional attempts to have Sherlock Holmes solve the most famous unsolved case of, Vic of Victorian era, of his era, uh, the Jack the Ripper murders. Uh, in the 1960s, there'd been a uh, rather fun, sleazy picture called A Study in Terror with John Neville. A Study in Terror is a whodunit. It's much closer in tone to the uh, the Conan Doyle originals. Uh, it's got suspects and motives and clues and surprises uh, and it has a rather nice period feel. It's very much a knockoff Hammer film. It's not made by Hammer but it has that look. It has, yeah, Barbara Windsor plays one of Jack the Ripper's victims so you kind of get a sense of where that's going for. Murder by Decree is a much more serious picture. It's more serious about Sherlock Holmes and it's much more serious about Jack the Ripper. It's a, a true crime uh, movie. It's based on actually a lot of scurrilous unfounded rumours but also on some serious historical research uh, that had taken place uh, in the, uh, the 1970s. If you stay through to the end credits you'll notice that um, it's acknowledged that the screenplay by the, the excellent playwright John Hopkins is, cre uh, is based on a book. Uh, it's based on a book called The Ripper File by these people, Elwyn Jones and John Lloyd. Now you'll notice that the paperback uh, edition I have here of the, of the Ripper File has another detective on the cover, not Sherlock Holmes, uh, for those of you who were around in the 1960s and 70s, you'll instantly recognise this is Stratford Johns, the actor, uh, playing um, Inspector Barlow, uh, a character who first appeared in the seminal British uh, police show, Z Cars, uh, and then continued into several other series, Softly, 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 Task Force, Barlow at Large. He was the, the, uh, the reigning tough cop uh, of his era. Um, all of those shows, although up and down, were really outstanding. But when they'd almost done as much as they could uh, with, with the character, uh, Barlow and his sidekick, uh, Watt, uh, the sergeant who, who doggedly stuck by him uh, through several TV series, the BBC made um, a docudrama called Jack the Ripper, um, and this book is a tie-in to that. It was a six-part series in which the, the frame is that the in the present day, Barlow and Watt, between seasons of Softly Softly, uh, are poring over all the evidence of this unsolved crime. Um, later, they did a follow-up series where they investigated other unsolved crimes, uh, like the, the murder of the princes in the tower and stuff like that. But this was a, a, a six-part major documentary series about Jack the Ripper, uh, which is, a, you know, since then, there have been so many documentaries and books and exposés and theories and everybody's got five new suspects uh, and ev every latest book uh, will try and convince you of something else. And the, the BBC uh, show did not actually come up with a definitive answer but it looked at what were the theories at the time. It was the first sort of mainstream um, advance of the theory that pinned the murders uh, on a man called Sir William Gull, who was the personal physician of Queen Victoria, uh, and who, it has to be said, was completely innocent of, uh, of the crimes. Uh, he was fitted up by a, uh, a fantasist called Stephen Knight, who invented this whole complicated uh, theory involving uh, the Masons uh, and an illegitimate royal heir uh, and a series of murders to cover up this truth uh, that led to the highest in the land, uh, which is, of course, the plot of Murder by Decree. Uh, later, it's the plot of um, 
Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell's graphic novel, From Hell, which was then filmed by uh, the Hughes brothers with Johnny Depp as the policeman. Um, the film of From Hell is pretty much a remake of Murder by Decree. Uh, it's, it, it, it carves out of um, Moore and Campbell's enormously complicated, challenging work, a narrative which coincidentally is exactly the same narrative that we get in, in Murder by Decree. Um, there was, in the interim, there's a Michael Caine miniseries called Jack the Ripper in uh, 1988 for the centenary of the crimes, which cuts out the Masons, but still says that William Gull did it. Uh, he, he's obviously become the, the, the favourite uh, suspect, or was for a while. Others have emerged subsequently. Some surprisingly convincing for this uh, age-old unsolved mystery. What is, has always struck me about the, the theory that pins the crimes on uh, an upper-class, knighted, respectable uh, pillar of the, the uh, Victorian community, uh, the embodiment of Victorian hypocrisy uh, and, yeah, outward virtue and inward sle seething, sleazy vice, is that we, as a culture, are doing exactly what the Victorians did when they said Jack the Ripper has got to be a foreigner. Yeah, it's like we we because we don't know who he was because he was never ca caught. He is who we want him to be, and at the time, uh, the the popular press, the public, the establishment wanted Jack the Ripper not to be British. Queen Victoria actually said that whoever did this wasn't British. Um, it's entirely possible he wasn't. Um, now, what we want. Jack the Ripper to be is the Jack the Ripper of Hammer films. Uh, of the, 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 it's the bloke in the top hat with a Gladstone bag full of knives, you know, walking through the foggy streets of, of Whitechapel, uh, preying on uh, yeah, um, Cockney sparrows. Uh, it wasn't actually foggy that autumn, so that's a, that's a um, part of the mythology that has come along with that. And I'm impatient with this as as an image although when i wrote a jack the ripper story uh, in my novel anno dracula i used exactly that as jack the ripper it was a doctor with a big bag of knives and a top hat it's sort of inescapable because murder by decree frames it as a fictional story as a sherlock holmes story i am much more tolerant of it. It also doesn't use the real name uh, of Sir William Gull, uh, as I say, an entirely innocent man whose um, legacy to uh, history is unusual. He coined the term anorexia nervosa. He was the, uh, the physician who first diagnosed uh, an eating disorder as a... As a uh, you can see why working for the royal family would have led him to that. So he was actually a man who was ahead of his time and, and uh, a, a, you know, a genuinely interesting and valuable person uh, who really, really didn't deserve to be tagged as the most uh, despised serial killer of all time. But anyway, the character we get in Murder by Decree is called Sir Thomas Spivey and he's somebody else. Uh, and I think we also don't really get much about his motivation or psychology. And he's on, only half Jack the Ripper. There are two culprits. Um, the other is a, 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 a coachman called Slade who actually uh, harks back a bit to previous Jack the Rippers. The, uh, it's the same name that Laird Krieger has in The Lodger, which is an earlier Jack the Ripper movie. But I think that why this film works for me is I think it's one of the best Sherlock Holmes pictures. The characters of Sherlock Holmes have been around for so long and have been reinvented so many times that it's hard to come up with a fresh angle on it. And currently, in the, in the last couple of years, we've had um, Robert Downey Jr., Benedict Cumberbatch, Johnny Lee Miller, various other actors 
have, even Jeremy Brett, have pre presented Sherlock Holmes as an emotional basket case, as a psychopath, as a sociopath, as, a, as an inadequate, as a, a, you know, a, a, a savant lunatic. Uh, this probably starts with Billy Wilder's wonderful The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, where Robert Stevens plays Sherlock Holmes rather like that. And it's been an attempt, I suppose, to take this character we're all very fond of, but we admit is rather unrealistic. Um, and I feel that it, there's been a, a, a trend in recent popular culture to look at characters like uh, Sherlock Holmes or Batman or Spider-Man, Doctor Who, whatever, and try and make them grim and intense and serious or to pathologize their characteristics in order to revisit the stories we liked when we were children but tell ourselves that they were serious and valued. Whereas Murder by Decree doesn't do that with Sherlock Holmes. It takes an approach which maybe recently the Ian McKellen film, Mr. Holmes, did, of making Sherlock Holmes a slightly more politically engaged, more obviously compassionate character. Christopher Plummer, I think, plays one of the great Sherlock Holmeses. He'd done it on television in a um, a half-hour pilot based on Silver Blaze that hadn't sold. Sold, but he's he's got the height, he's got the uh, the um, the aquiline features, he's got that little trace of wit, and that you sense is somebody who is genuinely brilliant but also slightly self-regarding and slightly pulls back from it. I think this has some of the best Holmes and Watson scenes ever shown on, on film. I think that uh, James Mason is one of the great Dr. Watsons. And one of the things I found problematic in all the recent attempts to do Holmes and Watson is that currently creators seem to think that Holmes and Watson hate each other. You know, that they are locked in a horribly dysfunctional, codependent relationship. You know, this uh, a, a drug addict and a thrill junkie in the, the BBC show, um, Sherlock. But what I love about Murder by Decree is it shows us the Holmes and Watson we want. The people who are actually our friends. I think that Christopher Plummer manages to make Sherlock Holmes human. Uh, he makes it... There, there's a sequence where Sherlock Holmes cries, which is very unusual in depictions of the character. These days, if you saw Jeremy Brett or Benedict Cumberbatch as Holmes crying, it would be, they would be crying out of pity for themselves, uh, for their uh, warped psyche, or for um, grievances done to their closest friend, usually Dr. Watson, although the circle expands a bit to include Mrs. Hudson sometimes, uh, and sometimes Brother Mycroft and sometimes not. In Murder by Decree, Sherlock Holmes meets a, a, a woman who's been horribly treated, who tells her story, played in a single scene by Geneviève Bujold, completely deserving the, uh, the special billing she gets. She absolutely knocks it out of the park. And you see Holmes is moved by this. There's a, a progression from the man who is entirely rational and sees crime as a puzzle to be solved to the man who is genuinely feeling and angry about the situation. And later on, he has a wonderful uh, sequence where he actually goes up against John Gielgud playing um, the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury. John Gielgud's a previous Sherlock Holmes. He played him on radio. And the back and forth there, I think, is really strong. It's a sense that Sherlock Holmes, as a character, can be used to do and say lots of in interesting things. The current trend of Sherlock in, in movie and TV is essentially fan fiction, is essentially to, um, to engage with his character and, and the world around him, uh, rather than, as Conan Doyle used him, to have him solve mysteries. Um, Murder by Decree uses Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson to explore 
a historical setting, a historical mystery, and to give a depiction of Victorian hypocrisy, the, uh, the, the callousness and cruelty of the, the political upper classes, although it's very tough on, the, um, uh, on, on cynical political radicals as well. There's almost a, a, um, a Joseph Conrad feel to the, the depiction of Whitechapel that you get in, in Bodo Uh It's a film that finds room for um, Donald Sutherland as a psychic, another real uh, life character, an odd footnote to the, the Jack the Ripper case, and an array of, I, I think, really great British character faces. There is a real sense of the squalor and how uncomfortable and cold Victorian London is. The pub sequences are not those kind of knees up with Barbara Windsor you get in A Study in Terror or the Hammer films. They look like genuinely dangerous places to be. Uh, it's maybe the, the, the film that, that best gives a sense of what Victorian Whitechapel was like. Uh, and Hopkins gives wonderful little tiny grace notes of of comedy the uh, the prostitute who's really proud that she's got all her own teeth and then is yeah absolutely bereft when she realizes one is loose uh is a perfect tiny bit of characterization these little thumbnail characters that we that we run into that give us the whole panoply of, of victorian london i think that, that there's a a strength to this there's a real sort of a texture uh it has, I think, a nice look. Uh, again, not very like other films on comparable subjects. It came out in 1979. It came out around the same time that uh, Time After Time, another Jack the Ripper movie, came out, which was even more uh, fantastical. Neither of those films did particularly well, although they're films that people remember 40 years on. Um, and they keep coming right. It's almost like that, that uh, some films can be called underrated so often that they're no longer really underrated. You know, it's like there were big hit films of those years that, that have completely gone by the wayside, that nobody really, you know, wants to look. I mean, they're, here we are doing a really nice Blu-ray special edition of this. Um, whereas I don't think anybody really cares about Kramer versus Kramer, which was like one of the most important films of, of, of that era uh, in terms of, you know, uh, winning awards and being respected. It's a film about rich people getting divorced. Yeah, we've seen loads of those. But this film about Jack the Ripper is still with us. It's still stuck in our minds. When uh, recently, sadly, um, Christopher Plummer died, uh, and we all sort of you know, had to cobble together the obituaries and look back on an incredible career. Um, I put his Sherlock Holmes up there with, I think, uh, obviously the sound of, sound of music. I, I, his, his evil Santa Claus in The Silent Partner is, I, I think, one of the great evil performances of, of the 70s. Uh, but I think his Holmes is, is among his best subtlest screen work because he takes the role seriously but not solemnly. <laughs>